Hey, brother. Hear me now. Brother, dog. Know me. Understand. Welcome to the Sargasm Podcast. I'm Robbie Thigpen. I'm Francesca Elmer. And I am Mar Fernandez. And we are your hosts for today. And we are going to share with you the latest ideas and concepts about sargassum and sargassum beaching events, which have become an international challenge. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome back to the Sargassum podcast. Um, Robbie and Mar, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. It's been a long, stressful week, but uh, lots of exciting news. So that's good. And uh, well, I've, I've had a pretty good week. I started my, my morning off with a cup of coffee and a bowl of cereal. And also, I'm, I'm pretty happy about that. I'm, later, I'm going to have some uh, chips to, for s- to snack on. And uh, it's, it's going to be a good day and all. <laughs> and um, we, we need to, uh, we got a new guest host today that's going to work with us occasionally. His name is Victor David. He's from India. And he's currently parked in uh, Mark, Martinique, uh, working with the university there. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Victor? Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, everyone. Nice to meet you today. And actually, uh, I, even if I don't look like I'm, I'm a French citizen, uh, I come from a former French colony in India, and I've been in, working in France for for a number of years now, as I'm not too young, <laughs> and uh, actually, I um, I came to Marquee uh, two years ago. Before that, I was in New Caledonia, where I lived for the past 22 years. When I got here in in Marquee, and I, I'm a researcher, I work with the French Research Institute, uh, and I work on environmental law and sustainable development law. And as soon as I got here in Marquee, uh, there was a call for projects uh, by the French uh, research agency, and the topic was Sargassum. As the, the, the local colleagues team didn't have anyone working on an environmental law, uh, I proposed uh, my services to them, as we say, and because I, I realized that Sargassum was seen only as a problem, and actually I, I've been working for the past six or seven years on the rights of nature. And uh, I have a project in the Pacific to recognize the Pacific Ocean as a legal entity. So I had a different view of surrogacy because I'm not a biologist, I'm not you know, aware of technical issues, but I realized that it was a problem indeed in the Caribbean, in the greater Caribbean, including the Mexican coast and Central American coast, and also the north of South America, because French Guyana has also problems. Um, so there are many actually legal problems related to, to Sargasm. So that's why I got involved in the project. And so my contribution to the to the project, which was um, accepted by the by the French Research Agency, and it is developed by the University of Des Antilles with colleagues from Brazil and colleagues from mainland France. And, you know, there are several work packages and I'm on a work package, which is about uh, legal aspects of sargassum and public policies. And, and I'm interested in what I call the multiple legal lives of sargassum. Well, that's if you can, you know, maybe we can uh, discuss about more uh, about it later that I think this should be fine to introduce myself. So, yeah, that sounds that sounds almost like a book title, "The Multiple Legal Lives of Sargassum." <laughs> I love it. Um, Thank you. Nice to have you with us, Vic. As somebody who's interested in law, you will be very helpful to us today when we're doing the interviews, because today we're actually going to talk to two members of the Sargasso Sea Commission. Um, Teresa McKay is the project manager of the Sargasso Sea Commission and has been with it since 2017. And Dr. David Freestone is the executive secretary of the commission. 
Um, the commission was established in 2014 with the goal of conserving the Sargasso Sea. Dr. Freestone um, worked before, before he worked for the Sargasso Sea Commission, he worked at the World Bank as head of international and environmental law group and deputy general counsel and senior advisor of the office of the general counsel. He is also a visiting scholar and professional professorial lecturer at the George Washington University Law School in Washington, DC. And he has written widely on the law of the sea and international environmental law and is the founder and editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Marine and Coastal Law. Thank you so much, um, Teresa and David, to make time to be with us today. And we're really looking forward to talking to you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Excellent, excellent. You know, one of the ways we like to get started off is, you know, um, by asking all of our guests, what does sargassum mean to you? And I think you guys are going to have some different responses than we normally get. So, Teresa, I'd, I'd like to start with you. What does sargassum mean to you? Sure, thanks, Bobby. I think sargassum is one thing where you're right. It definitely has had a bad public image, especially in the past few years, and especially even since I started with the commission in 2017. Um, but it really is this incredibly diverse ecosystem. And uh, even when we were in Bermuda in 2019, celebrating the fifth anniversary of the signing of the Hamilton Declaration that established the Sargasso Sea Commission, we had the opportunity to go out on a boat excursion and bring some buckets of sargassum up onto the boat and really get to see all the marine life living within it. And it really is this incredibly diverse ecosystem teeming with life. So when it is out in the open ocean where it belongs, it is an incredible ecosystem. Oh, I'm, I'm jealous. I'll just tell you right now, it's, it's been a fantasy mind to go out and visit that place. I, my only action is mostly just clumps, you know, coming up on the, here in the Atlantic Ocean right now. I haven't really experienced any of these beaching events. And also, yeah, so thank you. I'm, I'm, I, I like interviewing people that have done things that make me jealous at all. So, yeah, so thank you for that. How about you, Dr. Freestone? What, what does sargassum mean to you? Well, Tess put it very well. I mean, I think it's with if you like the case for the defense. We're, so we 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 and all the uh, the team that work on the Sargasso Sea Commission, we see this as the we call it the floating rainforest of the Atlantic. I mean, it's a, and I've got a large for those of you who can have pictures as I've got a large uh, mat of uh, sargassum behind me, which is a golden color. It doesn't look so good when it starts rotting on the beach, but it's. Um, but it's, as, as Tess said, it's where it is. So it was the famous hotelier, was it for Charles Forte? He said, there are only three things that are important about where you put a hotel. Location, 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 right? And that's exactly, if it's in the floating out in the open ocean, it's an amazingly diverse and really important and unique habitat. It's a, what, what they call a holopelagic seaweed. So it never touches the ground. So it spends all its life at sea. So that's used as a as a food stuff, as a as a shelter for for uh, young creatures and for even for spawning animals as well. That uh, a number of fish actually attach their their eggs to the to the to the sargassum itself. And it provides if you float anything in the ocean, fish will sit underneath it. So it's, it's the principle of the um, of the uh, you know, a, lot of, a lot of fishing techniques of actually putting out artificial rafts like that. So it's important for a lot of of endangered species like turtles, but also for threatened species like some of the whales, which which use actually we've seen pictures of whales getting underneath it and using it as sort of abrasive as they come up underneath it and let it rub down around the backs. It's quite quite a lovely sight to see, and then also for commercial species like billfish and uh, tunas, uh, uh, local species like wahoo and mahi mahi, where they called dorado the dolphin fish in the Caribbean. So that's a really important and diverse, uh, diverse system. Nice. So it's, it's kind of like an inverted ventus, right? Like you have this uh, benthic ecosystem floating in the ocean and harvesting all these species. So some of our listeners maybe don't know exactly where the Sargasso Sea is. Can you um, tell us about it? And I mean, you already went into that direction, by, but why is it worth uh, protecting it? Right, sure. So, in fact, uh, our office is actually in the uh, in the North America 
we have an office in North America, office of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And I think probably the, the year after I was appointed, I had at a meeting with the director general of IUCN and she leant forward and very quietly and said, where is the Sargasso Sea? <laughs> and nobody, everybody's heard of it, or most people have heard of it. Jules Verne made it famous and, and others, but people didn't know where it was. Well, it's really, it's, we call it the only sea without a coast because it's bounded by the currents of the, of the North Atlantic gyre. So it's around the islands of Bermuda, which is archipelago, one of the most Actually, Bermuda is one of the most remote archipelagos in the world because it's a thousand miles from any other land. Uh, and around these islands, around Jaya, uh, we have the, the, land, the uh, Gulf Stream and then the, uh, the uh, Azores Current and the Canary Current. And so that forms a, a, a anticyclonic, a clockwise uh, movement of currents, which holds the ocean system in place, but also holds the mats of Sargassum as well. Uh, so that it is, it is unique in that sense as well, because it's it's held in place by uh, by by the current systems, which of course also hold other things, and increasingly plastic and other human litter. But but uh, for thousands of years, so it is it is a it is a uh, it's a floating system rather than a benthic system, but it has probably been there for millions of years. So it's had an impact on the. Uh, on the benthic environment as well but it's also extremely deep we're talking 4,000 meters um, around the coast of Bermuda, Bermuda. so it's uh, a, a really is a, a, a unique system and that's why we focused on it really because um, if I can move on sort of slightly forward from that that the United Nations has been looking at the idea of protecting or certainly conserving areas beyond, they call it areas beyond national jurisdiction, that's areas of the high seas which are beyond 200 miles, and there's been a pressure for the last, there's been discussions for about the last decade and a half within the UN General Assembly as to whether we should have a new treaty, a new convention to actually regulate activities in the high seas. It's sort of like, there's a very famous Law of the Sea Convention from 1982, but in 1982 people, we, people didn't know a lot, a lot about high seas they thought it was not rather barren area and the, the resources they weren't really aware of so I think it's this is a over the years we've actually over the last 30 40 years we've actually realized that our the lungs of our planet are actually the oceans and particularly the high seas areas and we're doing things often inadvertently which are having adverse impacts so we seized on the Sargasso Sea as a very highly visible and very obvious system which deserves protection which could use as a sort of pilot for the, seeing how, whether you can, can put protection measures in place uh, for a high seas area like that. Very cool. Yes, it's definitely more visible than um, a phytoalgae bloom or something like that. Right. So what is the role of the Sargasso Sea Commission? Okay, so, so that runs on from what I was saying. So, but... Uh, 2009 I think so just over more than a decade ago um, I was part of a group that actually went to Bermuda and we actually talked to the Bermudan government as to whether they would actually be interested in supporting a measure you know a, a movement of this kind and we gathered together a number of eminent scientists um, the, the Prime Minister of Bermuda the Premier made a little very eloquent little recording which we showed to a number of of potential donors and we formed what was then called the Sargasso Sea Alliance. I was the executive director of the Alliance and the intention of that was to move forward and look at ways in which we could develop protection measures for this high seas era which the North Sea Convention it doesn't really help. It's not, there isn't really a framework for that. Um, after a couple of years we got a number of governments interested about 15 or 16 governments were interested most of the EU members, the UK, the United States, uh, the Azores, which is you know on the other side of the of the Sargasso Sea, on the on the eastern side, uh, which so that's part of Portugal, but it's an autonomous area. A lot of the islands as well, the Bahamas, the British Virgin Islands. Uh, we also got the Dominican Republic interested as well because they have they look out over the towards the north. So a lot of a lot of countries, great diverse. Monaco as well has been one of our great supporters. The um, Prince Albert II of Monaco is a great advocate for ocean conservation, so they got really interested as well. And we decided that 
rather than try and develop a treaty, which was likely to take years and years, that we would pull governments together and have a political declaration. So the, it took us a couple of years to negotiate the text, and we had some ups and downs, even with the text of a non-binding political declaration. But the 2014, it's the Hamilton Declaration on Collaboration for the Conservation of the Sargasso Sea. So the, the governments that signed it, initially only five, but now we have 10, all agree that they will work together with the commission, which they appoint, or which is appointed actually by the government of Bermuda on their advice, uh, to uh, put conservation measures in place. Uh, and that's, we've been going now for, as Tess said, it's now six years, so it's the sixth anniversary next week. Mm -hmm. yeah. On the 11th. Yeah, the 11th of March. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Well, 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 speaking of the Hamilton Declaration, what, what, you know, um, what exactly does this do to, to protect this Sargasso Sea? Well, the, the declaration itself is, is non-binding. I mean, it's a political declaration by, I say, now 10 governments. Uh, we joined by Dominican Republic, the Bahamas. We've got uh, the Cayman Islands uh, signature as well. Uh, so we're and, we've, and Canada joined, which was obviously a very important player as well. So we've actually got a, a, a number of developed countries uh, as well as a number of developing countries from the uh, from the Caribbean area. So all of them, are, well, most of them, are members of some of the main organisations which do have regulatory powers in the in the high seas. So without making this too much of a legal lecture, right? Which, uh, David would be able to help us with as well. Uh, we actually, uh, uh, there's the International Maritime Organization, which regulates traffic through the high seas. There's the Seabed Authority, which regulates uh, seabed exploration and seabed mining. Uh, and then there are a couple of fishing organizations, which get traditionally get rather bad rap, but there's the Northwest Atlantic Fishing, Fishing Organization, which is NAFO, which is to the north of the Sargasso Sea, just part, just north of Bermuda. So part of the Sargasso Sea is within their area. And then the whole of the Atlantic is, is the remit of the International Convention, the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tuners, ICAT, um, cruelly being called the International Conspiracy to Catch All Tuners. I don't see, uh, but it's uh, but it's actually beginning to get its act together. It's not done a terribly good job with bluefin tuna. You've probably heard, but it, we are actually been working with them for ten years, and we are actually making some progress in convincing the parties that this that the Sargasso Sea is a an area part of their area, which is actually worth uh, taking special measures for and special importance of. And a lot of the, a lot of the parties now support that. And we've been working with their ecosystem subcommittee to actually develop indicators, etc. So we've got some, we've the, the Northwest Atlantic Fisheries Organization has closed off all the sea mounts in the Sargasso Sea, and that in the area within their regulatory area. So that was our first big success. And we'll still we're we've signed an MOU with that with the Seabed Authority, and we're still working with IMO. So we sort of made some progress, but it's fairly slow. These meetings work they only have as many of these conventions meet once a year you know things put on the agenda it takes them two or three years to reach the top of the agenda you know so it's this is a long task um, and we've recently just been given uh, a three million dollar grant by the global environment facility which is uh, uh, as the trustee of that is the world bank it's a body administered by the uh, united nations um, uh, uh, development program, the United Nations Environment Program, and the World Bank is a tripartite arrangement. And they, they have given us a, this is the first high seas ecosystem grant they've given to us. And we're going to do a, um, a what they call the technical term is a diagnostic analysis, an ecosystem, which is like an assessment, which is major. This is going to take us uh, about two or three years. And then we're going to put forward a, um, a strategic program for the conservation, long-term conservation of the uh, the SAP, the Strategic Action, uh, Action Program. And that's, we hope that the, all the signatories and others will sign on to support that. And we don't know what the result of that will be, but we're hoping that might be a rather stronger system than we have at the moment, perhaps even a treaty-based, a local, you know, local uh, localized ICs, uh, ocean governance treaty, we're saying. So quite exciting time for us with that. 
Has, has there been any, uh, to, to get this declaration, the Hamilton Declaration ratified, did you run into any new or unusual problems getting that taken care of? And Well, I mean, the, the, the main unusual problem that we ran into was the one you've just been talking about. So in 2011, so 10 years ago, and I think it was maybe March or April, um, I actually was in Antigua and I saw the first day, these, the first time these huge mats started to come in from the south. Now, I've been going to the Caribbean a lot and every, every March or April, um, mats of sargassum would come from the north, from, this, from the Sargasso Sea, and fishermen would love it because they bring, you know, Dorada, the Mahi Mahi, they bring Wahoo, their catches would go up, they'd love it. This, is a, this was a different proposition. These are much bigger mats and they're coming from the south. And so, you know, we were all perplexed. So from having been, so from Sarga having a mission of actually convincing everybody how wonderful the Sargasso Sea was, suddenly the mission was, became different because suddenly everybody knew what it, what it was and they didn't like it. So we've, that's been a major issue for us. So we've had to decide whether this you know, how we should adapt to that and we've decided that it's an important issue but it's not our core concern right our mission is the high seas part of it and this is an unfortunate and we think anthropogenic result of warming and changes in ocean currents that has resulted in this wonderful uh, algae becoming you know a, a pest i've actually had to appear on a number of panels one was actually called is sargassum an environmental hazard so i was the case for the defense no it's not but it can be you know it's location right so exactly so now we basically have these like two big patches of sargassum so one in the sargasso sea and one now in the middle of the of the atlantic which is the one coming to the coast and um which one like, I guess the Sargasso Sea Commission is focusing on the Sargasso Sea, on the original one. But what about the one that is offshore? So not the one reaching to the coast, but the one that is offshore in the middle of the Atlantic. Are you considering or are you involved in any projects with that Sargasso? Well, that, that, uh, that's a whole different agenda, right? It's a high seas problem, but it's a different agenda. And that, I mean, also just, it's, it's not a solid mat, right? So it's large mats and windrows, et cetera. And um, it, was for, it was actually discovered and it's, it's um, uh, interesting. I mean, for, in his first, first voyage, uh, Christopher Columbus, it's not politically correct to say that he discovered anything these days because he didn't, right? There were people there, but there was nobody in the Sargasso Sea and he did actually discover, he was the first to report it. And he said the mats were so big that the vessels, that his sailboats, which remember were quite small, got, they was worried that they get completely stuck. Uh, so we don't see mats like that anymore. And I think that's probably a climatic change, but it's also probably the result of large ocean going vessels breaking them up. So, so that's, we've already had some major impact on that. And the same, so the second C, as you said, is actually, is as another, so we, I talked about the North Atlantic gyre, but there's also, a, and you've probably had scientists talking about this, I know that you're uh, better acquainted this probably than I am, but there is this uh, equatorial recirculation zone, which goes between the North of South America and the West Coast of Africa. Uh, and, they think that's being fueled by uh, by nutrients from the Amazon and from the Orinoco, and that it's actually causing, you know, when we say an algal bloom, the bad news, right? And this is algae, right? Uh, so, the, but this is but it's macro algae, big algae, and it's being fed by this and and going around. They found huge amounts on on the coasts of Sierra Leone and uh, Senegal and the west coast of Africa. And then it comes back and it comes in because it's, it's anti-cyclonic again, it's coming in from the south. If you see it goes up to the north to uh, West Africa and then turns around and then comes back in uh, to the, to the, from the south. So, and then it's reached as far as Mexico. I mean, I've, I've seen it in, off the coast on the, on the coast of uh, the Yucatan. It's horrific, huge, huge piles, 10, 15 feet high. And, and it, when it rots, it smells terrible. I mean, it's a, uh, um, rotten eggs, right? What's that? Hydrogen sulfide. So it, it, it is a problem. It's killing 
young fish, it's killing the turtles that are coming off the beach. So it's it's become a problem. So I think it's more of an of a if you like a local management problem of how well, how you deal with it, how you block it if you like, how you use the material. There's a huge amount of organic material that you could use. We were actually one of our partners is the University of Exeter in the UK, which is looking at ways in which you could use it as biofuel. Um, so and we be, totally support that. We don't want them going and harvesting it in the Sargasso Sea, but when it's a problem like that's ideal and lots of other uses in Barbados they've been using it as fertilizer and so there are lots of uses for it so that's the more I think of the more productive approach to this it's not when it's at sea it doesn't necessarily need to be conserved um, it but it you know once it starts to get close then there's maybe the interventions which some form of concerted action to do to approach that would be uh, would be useful as well I think um, we're a little concerned, actually, there, so about it because, well, no, we're very concerned, but I mean, in terms of the Sargasso Sea, we're concerned about it because it's actually a different form. It's a variant called, we know, everybody knows about coronavirus variants, right? So we understand this is a similar thing. So it's a variant called, there are two main types, fluitans and natans. Um, natans tends to be towards the north, fluitans more the south of the Sargasso Sea, and this is natans eight uh, which is a, a variant which is um, less diverse we think uh, and there's less associated biodiversity so if it comes back into the Sargasso Sea which it could if it gets into the Gulf it'll come out through the Gulf through the, by the Miami Straits through into the Gulf it could get back in it could actually start to take over the Sargasso Sea and change it structurally so that's one of the things the guys in Bermuda are monitoring and they've seen more Natanz 8 around there than they have before, but it's that's still just a, a potential issue. But given the amounts which are coming, uh, that's you know likely to be a problem too. I appreciate you mentioning that these other things. So a couple of our uh, more fun uh, interviews we've done is with people doing different things. We we talked with some folks up in Yucatan, the state of Yucatan. They're making paper. And right. some other things. There's uh, some people in uh, Quintana Roo. They're making soap for uh, the tourism industry. But I think it's really nice that you make this uh, distinction between the original Sargasso Sea as a place that we should preserve, conserve because of its high biodiversity and its high value as an ecosystem versus this new sargassum that is causing these floodings on the beaches of the Caribbean and that that one is a different story and that maybe that one is good to be collected and used for different purposes. Yeah. yeah, so if we can help in any way we with this other problem, and it is a problem, right? We, we try to do that, but it's, as I say, we have a limited budget and limited sort of uh, uh, focus, and that's, that, that's not been an issue, but we've been working with one of our partners is NASA. NASA are actually doing an interesting project with us on high seas using their, uh, all the accumulated data they have on uh, 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 remote sensing data on things like eddies, currents, eddies, salinity from space you can do, which is unbelievable, um, ocean temperature, etc. And then they they're, they're hoping to put that into a into a platform where we could overlay it with things like fish movements from tagged fish and animal movements from you know tagged whales, etc., turtles, and then get some idea of you know migratory corridors, etc. So that's there's a lot of work being done with that. So NASA has been a great uh, supporter and they actually gave some money to one of our collaborators from the University of South Florida, uh, Dr. Chumin Hu. I don't know if you've come across him, but he was the one that first started the remote sensing. Uh, use, actually, in the end, he couldn't use the NASA satellites. He was using a NOAA satellite, but he's, he's been one of the pioneers of that. Now, now I see there's a project in the University of Guadalupe, I think, which is actually taking that further. So. This is not. This requires huge amounts of money, which is not something we have, uh, and and it's an important problem. It's a development problem. I mean, there's a lot of setbacks of of development. Most of the Caribbean countries depend very, very heavily on tourism. In Mexico, particularly, the Yucatan is the like the, the, the Riviera and the, the Yucatan Riviera. Billions of dollars they make, so they re it's it's worth. They need to invest some money, and I think aid agencies have been looking at it as well as a way of sort of helping to 
to uh, alleviate the you know, impacts on, on economic problems. Yes. Um, so from your experience with law, thinking about the future of the great Atlantic sargassum belt, I know, as you said, at the moment, it's mostly that local authorities are concerned with how are we managing this and local entre entrepreneurs get, um, come up with, with ideas of how to use it. So we have too much sargassum, but do you think that at one point maybe there will be governments fighting over the sargassum and maybe they have to negotiate who can use it or how do you see this going in like a law like will there be laws about sargassum in the Caribbean as well not just um, in the sargassum sea well that's interesting I mean it, most of them would, would pay large amounts of money to get rid of it I think so rather than be squabbling over who it belongs to <laughs> so it's a it's a joint resource right I don't see there's a need for a specific instrument on it. I mean, the 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 one of the one of the organisations that we are we have a memorandum of understanding with is the the Cartagena Convention on uh, Environment of the Wider Caribbean, which is based in Kingston in Jamaica, um, and uh, the Executive Secretary there and Lorna Innes, we've work, been working together with that, that they have a program which is looking a little bit at that, but they don't have a large amount of money. But if there were to be some sort of framework, I think that would probably be an appropriate place to do it through the, the Cartagena Convention. It's already got four, five protocols. I actually helped with the negotiation of one on specially protected areas and wildlife in 1990. Uh, so they've got one on land-based sources of pollution. They've got uh, um, um, an emergency response of oil spill uh, protocol. So that something of that kind might be a useful device for them to sort of, but more about, I think the issue at the moment is not squabbling over the use of it, but collaborating in early warning systems, right? And I think it's clear that the French uh, Antilles, uh, Guadeloupe and, and, and Martinique are actually sort of got the technology to help with that with Barbados. Barbados is like the advanced station as it comes in from the Southeast. So it's gonna hit Barbados first, they can see it from there. So that, that sort of collaboration to warn countries when it's coming so they can deploy booms or uh, use clean up you know, uh, materials. That's, and then the more they use it, the more they find uses for it, then, then there may be more uh, there may be more demand than supply but i can't see that happening unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> unless we you know we clean up our act and some of the big rivers i mean it's not and may, there's also pollution coming from the west african rivers as well which is sort of feeding it on its way um so no i can't it, I, I think there's going to be more supply than demand yes <laughs> like, yeah it, it's a very interesting um problem because these Caribbean nations have to deal with the sargassum getting to their shores, but they could argue that partly the Amazon runoff is is responsible for it. So, but they have to pay the whole cost of cleaning it up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, that's a wider question of liability here. We can ask. Uh, yeah. Uh, exactly. David, one, of the other, one of the other sources of nutrients for this increase in sargassum is actually upwelling in the subtropical Atlantic caused by climate change. And I mean, again, who has the liability for climate change and the changes in wind patterns, right? The Amazon or the Congo River might be a little bit easier to tackle down. Who is responsible? But upwelling happening in the middle of the subtropical Atlantic is, yeah, impossible to, to pinpoint. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, I follow the UN Convention on Climate Change as well, you know, the UNFCCC, and the, the, the issues of liability and loss and damage are still very, very controversial. Um, no compensation provisions, but there are financing me mechanisms. And the I was talking about the Global Environment Facility. That is the uh, operating entity of the financial mechanism of the Fl Climate Convention, as it is of the Biodiversity Convention. So there is, there are, they're not huge, but there are, financial flows that maybe could be utilized that i saw there was a project which the the world maritime university are actually a fairly modest one i think funded by sweden which is also looking at the ways in which they could assist the caribbean countries to address this very interrupting you sir. 
Yeah, no, I was going to add, and what about um, using sargassum as a carbon sequestration and then tap on the carbon credit potential when once the carbon credit market develops, and then you could have another monetary asset to sargassum. Yeah. So that's one of the things that they parted to Paris. The parties haven't yet agreed. The famous Paris rule book will look at this e issue of trading. And I think we're sort of past offsetting, right? We... we everybody we're now looking at being carbon neutral so i think we're just looking less at offsets in the sense of you know i can carry on being a naughty boy and pay for it by doing this we're looking now at just general actions to reduce emissions right and it may be that that uh sargassum plays some role in this but i don't think we want to be fertilizing the sargassum to make it produce more in order to sequester more carbon uh, because it's you know the problem is it if it ends up on the beach then it rots and it goes up in the sky again so we're getting you know so that it is a problem as to we early on in our project that one of the well-known environmental organization came and said oh we'll be happy to support you with this we, we think we could fertilize the sargassum and actually increase you know sequestration um we just don't want the sargassum seed to be messed about with any more right we don't want, want to we'd rather the, we leave it as much as we can as a as a pristine it's not really pristine because it's although it's a remote area of the atlantic it is between the americas and the europe so there's a lot of activity um so you know we, yeah, we prefer to leave it alone yeah, yeah definitely what, 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 go ahead I was just going to say that, of course, if it would be, if the growth of sargassum would be enhanced, let's say in the middle of the subtropical gyres, then you really need to make sure that it's contained and that it doesn't right. spill off to the coast, because then, of course, you're making the problem worse and not best. Yeah. 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 And what, what is, go ahead. Well, all I was going to say was in the sargassum sea, the only bit in the middle is Bermuda, and they've been used to having sargassum wash up. Most of their, much of their coast, is, as Tess was saying, is actually beach nourishment right it was based on sargassum over millions of years sorry yeah, yeah no worries no that's the important thing but follow up what you see a ter terraforming might be all well and good for uh elon musk and mars <laughs> but um for us i, I kind of agree with you for us it, it, prevention is cheaper than the cure hmm. and and it's better to prevent these things but um even if we get do get the net zero carbon we still got a huge amount of uh, mm. carbon that we need to get out of the atmosphere again. And so those are, those are things we need to think about. You know, I, I agree with you. We don't need to use sargassum or anything to get back to net zero. But what we do need to do is we need to, we, we may need tools in the future when, if we do get to net zero where um, we can take some of this stuff out of the atmosphere because we, we, we need to be, negative doing negative right. stuff right now because um i mean just look at these you know wet wet storms that we've had lately i mean these that's a direct result of the warming seas and we we need to be as a as a as a community as an internet as a global community we need to you know we should be at this point should be hyper aware of what's going on but um right. you know Th yeah, that's just my two cents. In the end, it's not in the future that we need those tools. We need to have them as soon as possible because as we start them, we're going to get to net zero before we end up being net zero in emissions. We shouldn't just go net zero in emissions and then start sequestering carbon. We should do both of them at the same time. This is right. All right. Victor, do you have any questions that we haven't asked yet? Uh, thanks, Fran. Yes, um, I, I don't really have a question, but I was um, thinking about what we were saying on, on liabilities and one of the research uh, orientations uh, I was thinking about is how we could uh, apply the common but differentiated responsibilities we have on climate change in the UN and UNFCC to the sargassum problem. Because it's a common problem. We don't, I think we don't, we can't accuse any country, any single country, for instance, Brazil, because of the Amazon or whatever, 
or the West African countries because of the Congo Basin. So it's a common problem for, for, for the entire Atlantic community, if I can put it that way. And um, I think we, uh, maybe it's a, it's a possible way, possible way of um, thinking the Ferguson problem because it is, it is common responsibility because climate change is also a part of the co causes of uh, Ferguson uh, influxes we had since 2011. And we can't accuse any African, North African country because uh, I've read and heard on different webinars that uh, the Ferguson uh, belt is fed by the Saharan pans, you know, which fly over the, the Atlantic and they nurture actually the, the, the Sargasson bloom. So are we going to say that in African, North African countries have to pay for, you know, whatever problems we in the Caribbean have? So I think it's a, exactly like the climate change problem. It's a common problem. There are d differentiated liabilities. And I think maybe we could apply that reasoning to the Sargasson problem, the reasoning we have for climate change. That's, well, one lead I wanted to, to share with you, um, uh, you know, from the legal point of view, that's one of the legal aspects of the problem of Ferguson. And the second point I wanted to maybe um, you probably know about it, uh, there are some specific problems with the French uh, Antilles because um, when, when the Ferguson uh, influxes come on, on shore, actually they, they pick up whatever chlorodicon, which is a pesticide uh, that went into the ocean. And some areas around Martinique, for instance, are no, no take areas for, for fish because they are, they are poisoned actually by the chlorodicon. Uh, and when the sargassum comes back on the shores, it brings back the chlorodicon that went outside. So it, it can't be used for, as a fertilizer. It can't be used as anything, you know, that goes into land because even Stocking uh, Sargasson uh, in the French uh, Artie in Guadeloupe, and I think is a problem because they may contaminate the soil again <laughs> with uh, with uh, torticon and arsenic and whatever. So uh, that's that's another man management problem. And and what, what I was saying is it's not the fault of Sargasson. <laughs> so uh, you know it's uh, it's mainly a man made problem. And so we have to think about how we can uh, solve it from a public policy point of view. I don't know if it makes sense to, to you. Yeah, I'm happy to sort of make a few comments if I may. So certainly, I mean, when we're talking about the negotiation of the 1992 UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, at that point, early days, I think that the developed countries accepted pretty obviously that they were the ones that were had been responsible for this historically, mm. right? It was the Industrial Revolution was spawned in, although I live in Washington, you probably detected that I wasn't born here. I'm Brit. Uh, and the UK actually, I think, has the highest uh, uh, historical uh, contribution to climate change. The great uh, navies of the Elizabethan age of the 16th, 15th, 16th century were built with oak trees, which they cut down, right? So they're cutting down all these trees and they've been deforesting the UK. And then the UK was also the place with the, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, burst mm -hmm. burning coal. So I think that was accepted that the developed countries, so that was, so for those who don't know your way around these conventions, there are two, there are two annexes to the convention and annex one lists the countries, developed countries, uh, and economies in transition who've traditionally been those who've actually made contributions. So that, and so the idea of common but differentiated responsibility is sort of based on that idea that it's the developed countries, developing countries that didn't have, let's say so much of a contribution, right, to it, so historically. Um, and now that has begun to change quite radically. For example, uh, China, per, not per capita, but China is now, uh, I think probably the biggest uh, contributor of greenhouse gases after the United States, but the United States is way ahead per capita contribution. Mm -hmm. uh, but the European countries, again, fairly heavily after that. So, so this is the idea of the, the regime is based on this principle that really 
uh, and there's another annex which is the more the wealthier developed countries and they're the ones that contribute to the global environment facility and to the to the financial mechanisms so but it's always been a controversial issue right does that mean yeah. that the developed country, developing countries are off the hook no i mean i think we're all in this together now i think the, the merits of the of the paris agreement is that now everybody isn't taking on uh, making their own contributions, they determine what they will be the nationally determined contributions that they're going to make. But those, are, the, you know, they, they're everybody. We accept that everybody has to be playing a part in that. So when that comes to sargassum, this is difficult because uh, it's actually uh, probably the developing countries that have been like, particularly Brazil, maybe Guyana as well, the Orinoco, but also Senegal, you know, the countries of West Africa that have been, it's the pollution from those. Um, rivers, which is uh, which has been contributing to this, so it's a it's kind of dangerous area to go in, I think. And I was I was a bit surprised when people in Antigua started talking about there being arsenic in the sargassum. You know, you can't use it. Well, so my I say I talked to my oceanographers, and they said, well, there's arsenic in seawater, right? But so small. But no, I think it might actually be contaminated. We think now that it's contaminants that are coming from some of these river runoff so this is an issue for some research i think and i know there are some people doing that uh, in, in the antilles as well the french antilles but also i know in, Bermuda, in, Bar in barbados they've been looking at this as well but yeah we have to be careful about what we use it for if it's going to be contaminated with some of this issue so mm. interesting thoughts yeah we had the the guys from c combinator um some weeks ago with us on the podcast and there are some companies already that are figuring out ways to remove the arsenic uh, from the sargassum. And also yeah. depends on where this, where you collect the sargassum, it has different levels of arsenic. We also had this nice interview with Dr. John Millet from the UK. All right. And the range is, is huge. So of course it depends uh, where it is and where it comes from, but you're right. We should be careful what we use it for and check that it, it doesn't have high quantities of arsenic in it. Well, I mean, I, I know Antigua, which is a very dry island. So they said, oh, we can use it for, for fertilizer. And they said, but it's full of salt. And they said, oh, you just leave it out in the rain. And they kind of look <laughs> at the sky and say, what rain? <laughs> it, just, just, it only rains like a few months of the year. So especially <laughs> you. In the meantime, it's broken down. And you know, so, yeah, so everything is local, right, in the sense of using it and the Well, this has been a really nice interview today. Thank both both of you for, for being with us and all. And um, if you do, you have any closing comments before we leave? We didn't hear much from you, Teresa. So I I need a closing comment from you. And I'll um, but yeah, anything y'all like to add, and and then we'll let you go. Sure. I guess one thing I'd like to add uh, for those of you who are uh, watching the podcast and not just with the audio, I see you guys have. Uh, in your background, some little sargassum critters in the bottom left corner. And I definitely recommend one of our partners in Bermuda, the Nonsuch Expeditions, has a great photo series of close-up photos of some of the really cool uh, creatures nice. that live when in the sargassum, including my one of my favorite fish, the sargassum frogfish. So I would definitely recommend checking them out. Excellent. Yeah, send us your contact. Thank you. We'll, be, we'll be glad to get in touch with them. Thanks. Oh, thank you all. So thanks again to for you know for talking to us and I'm um, you know enjoyed talking to you very much and um, I, I'm glad that we have, we were able to spread hopefully the story that you know there's bad parts of the story but there's also a good part so and I'm glad that you've got as Tess picked up her eyesight's better than mine that you've actually got uh, some really the good bits right the endemic species that attached to us that that's tremendous so thank you very much nice to meet you all thanks so excellent much. excellent thank, thank you all so much. And, all. and with that, we'll let, we'll let y'all go and we're going to talk for a few more minutes and, and right. also, yeah. so yeah, so I think we're going to be in touch with you guys again. So once again, thank you so yeah, much you on, on behalf of all of us. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye. 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 Shall I leave you guys? No, you, no, man, you, you, you get to hang out too. You, you were not the interviewee. You were one of the yeah. interviewers. Yeah. So you, you kind of can't leave yet. You're stuck with us. <laughs> and, uh, um, so what do you guys think about that? This, this is like, okay, this was, this was awesome because this is our first real interview about the, the, uh, this important ecosystem and a lot. I was wrapped in awe myself. 
Yes, I think that the most interesting part I took away is like they started this this mission on we have to conserve the Sargasso Sea as one of the important offshore um, places. And they're they're on the way, they're trying to tell everybody what the Sargasso Sea is. And then the Sargasso beaching events happen. And this this could have been catastrophic for them. Like you are on this mission and then there's this other event happening that completely derails your mission and everybody now hates the the species you want to conserve. But I think they did a really good job at, at still getting the declaration going and making sure people knew the difference between the sargassum that's beaching and the sargasso sea and that people still value the sargasso sea despite of what's happening in the Caribbean and in Africa and yeah in Mexico and, and Florida. Yeah I think that's precisely the trick so you you need to make this very clear differentiation between the Sargasso Sea is an amazing ecosystem that we really should protect and preserve and conserve and all the efforts of the Sargasso Sea Commission should move forward. But then, you know, the sargassum that escaped the Sargasso Sea and now is creating a, a mess everywhere. That one is a different story. And I'm still uh, really interested. And I know we've been talking about this in different podcasts from different points of view, but. I still don't know if the if the species that thrive in the Sargasso Sea are also thriving in the middle of the Sargasso Belt in the middle of the Atlantic. And I don't think anyone knows that yet because if we want to make the differentiation between you know, the Sargasso Sea with all the nice species associated to it that we want to protect, then we need to know that the other Sargasso, the one that is landing on the beaches, doesn't have that same value. If we, Especially if we want to use it for mass carbon sequestration or creating biofuels or you name it. You know, if we want to collect that in, in huge amounts and use it for something, we need to know that we're not destroying any unique ecosystem. We need to know that this is, you know, a bloom of this macroalgae and that no other important organisms are associated to it. I know for, for one that um, there are some genetic studies going on. Uh, many research teams that are doing research uh, on on genetic aspects of sargassum all over the Atlantic to see if there is a new variety or new species. I don't know how you that scientific guys put it, but uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm aware of such studies, and that will determine if you know if it comes from if they originate from the sargassum sea or if they are new kind of. Uh, blooms that are uh, popping out from the the Atlantic belt, and so I think we have to wait for uh, some uh, conclusive studies from the scientific uh, teams. Uh, one thing I'd like to add to what Mara said is the uh, that's kind of a slippery slope you you were discussing there, because um, you look at mine tailing ponds and all in the areas around mining or places where. The, the dirt is just full of arsenic and cadmium, other heavy metals, just, you know, toxic stuff is in the ground. And initially it, it kills everything. Mm. But eventually you'll start seeing certain plants begin to colonize this toxic soil because they were in the periphery and they became a little bit numb and they, you know, they evolved very quickly. And, and so they began to re-exploit this toxic ground. Now you'll find that, uh, these plants will have a lot of these heavy metals in them, but they become taller of them. Just like mangroves are simply, uh, they're not a particular genus or, or anything. They're, they're trees that are tolerant of salt water. And that's what these plants have done. And so nature has a way of exploiting things. And, and I would mm -hmm. say this this new thing that you're talking about, I'll bet there's, there are lots of stuff out there that are recruiting in this new area as well and turning it into this new unique thing. So that's uh that's something we we need to consider yeah you're saying that probably the north atlantic belt is uh, sorry the atlantic belt of sargassum is being colonized by a lot of species and that it will become also a valuable ecosystem is that what you mean well i don't think that i could say that um with any academic credentials backing what i'm saying or any references but 
from, you know, as, as I said, this Antico level is, you know, things get exploited and all and I There's a lot of larval stuff that's floating, you know, in pelagic in the, uh, you know, the, the light zone, you know, column of water. And I would think that when a lot of this stuff hit it, oh, this looks like a good place to live. I think we'll hang out here for a while. Sargassum is actually doing that. Sargassum is exploiting new conditions that are appearing in the oceans and that are not like other species are not able to exploit. And that's why Sargassum is winning. I, it, 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 exactly. And, and I would dare say that these other species where this is happening are exploiting the, this new ecosystem as well. Yeah. And, um, but that, that, that's, just, that's just my guess. I don't know. But about the arsenic is really interesting what you said because actually sargassum has also been suggested as a bioaccumulator of arsenic to remove it from seawater so that it doesn't get into other, you name it, seafood, fish, whatever that humans consume. So you yeah. can what? Do it the other way around, right? That you use the sargassum to sequester the arsenic and bring it out of the system. Yeah, I think something, an area that we, we need a lot more research in is mining these plants for these things in the place like I'm talking about in, in this here, if we could learn to mine those things, um, think of what kind of, what, you know, a big problem we have here in the states of estrogen and estrogen mimics and, uh, uh, and uh, medicines that are estrogen mimics that are, you know, we're taking and passing through our bodies and they're entering our treatment plant, water treatment plants. And, all, and then this water is dumped into the to the uh, rivers and all that um and and there's a lot of this stuff and these these estrogen mimics and estrogens are causing a lot of issues with uh, sex reversal and this and this and this with a lot of the species that are, are near where this affluent uh runs in and if we can find plants that could take that up and then we could mine these estrogen mimics from these plants we could reuse these important compounds, you know, instead of making more mess, just reuse what we, this, this stuff we've mined. And I think we can do that with a lot of other things too, but I don't think that's an area that very many people are looking at, but I, th I think it's something very important that we need to do for the future. I mean, imagine mining a sewage treatment plant for valuable compounds, you know, pharmaceuticals and other things. I mean, that, 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 that should be just being amazing and the water would be so much cleaner when it was, you know, dumped in, and um, yeah, that's just that's something we need to be thinking about. Yes, that would be really useful because you would get rid of the pollution, but at the same time, you would have to, you also wouldn't have to make new, um, new estrogen or new arsenic and so on. So you're going circular, just by potentially using algae for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and going back to the Sargasso Sea Commission, I do see their conflict of interest in the sense that if Sargassum suddenly becomes this super useful um, algae that we can use for so many things, right? Biofuels, sinking carbon, uh, paper, soap, you name it, fertilizers, uh, absorbing arsenic, then will people stop collecting Sargassum once they reach the Sargasso Sea? Or will they say, well, we collected the one in the north of, in the Atlantic, we're gonna continue here and close to Bermuda. So I see their issue in trying to, you know, they're trying to protect this unique rainforest of the ocean, but at the same time, they don't want to hinder that this is used for something beneficial because of course they know that this could prevent beach strandings, but how are they gonna deal with that? Because you cannot put a fence around the Sargasso Sea. I think there, there are legal solutions for that, actually. So, you know, it, it, it could be the first international MPA because there, there are no uh, MPAs in international waters. So it could be, and that's where um, my project of maybe uh, a suggestion that, that I have made to Dr. Christian is, is to make the Sargasso Sea a legal entity with its own rights. And, you know, then uh, it could be a, a solution for protecting the Sargos Sea, not, not, not just an MPA, but, you know, as a legal entity uh, with its own rights. And, you know, so if you want to, to mine for Sargasum elsewhere, and because it is useful, because it is uh, used uh, for so many um, reasons, good enough. But uh, you don't touch 
the, the Sargos of Sea because it is, uh, it is a person, it is a legal person in itself. Uh, that the current management, the Sargos of Sea Commission, for instance, could be you know, the, the legal voice for, the, for the, the, this new legal entity. And there are also, uh, I, can, I think we could imagine, because it, it's, it's a question of imagination and you know, we have to create, we have to be creative. And you know, we, can, we could imagine a solution for, for the Sargos of Sea to protect it actually. If someday Sargos becomes the new oil of the, <laughs> you know, the, for, for the, the rest of the world. That's a cool thought, but Victor, you know more about this than, than any of us. Um, when you have an MPA, you declare it as a legal entity, and then, for example, no one is allowed to do fishing there. That's, that's on paper. But how do you actually do it on site? Do you put boats patrolling the borders of that area to avoid someone going in there, or you control them by satellite or radar and check that who is in there has a permit, or how, the, how is it done in real life and not, not just on the paper? Uh, the, the, the the difficulty, as I said, is it is because Sargos of Sea is in international waters. Maybe the, there is some part of the Sargos of Sea that is, you know, in coastal waters. Even if it's not surrounded by a coast, maybe the some EEZ of uh, Bermuda or um, you know goes into the Sargos of Sea. I'm I'm not very good at the geography of the, the Sargos of Sea, and we have to see what are the boundaries around the Sargos of Sea. To see if there is some part of the Sargos of Sea which is uh, inside some uh, island states' uh, waters, and then uh, you could imagine uh, having them patrolled. But of course, you could uh, monitor the, the Sargos of Sea from from the skies with with satellites, with drones, and you know. And if there is an agreement between the, the signatories of the Hamilton Declaration, for instance. Uh, they could decide to put um, the means of monitoring the Sargos of Sea, and you know, uh, if it is a if it is an international MPA or if it is an international treaty that recognizes the Sargos of Sea as a legal entity, then uh, you could say that no, it's a no take zone, for instance. So, so no take, no pass, so and so. Even boats cannot go through it. Not even think of fishing or you know exploiting uh, whatever resource there is within the service. That then you will need an international treaty. I'm afraid. Um, but if there is some part of the service of sea which is within some island states' uh, waters, uh, then those states can decide that within that area it's a no-pass zone, it's a no-take zone and make you know, national laws that protect the, the Sargos of Sea. So there are, there are, we had to look into it and because I haven't ever uh, looked that so close to the Sargos of Sea. So it's a, one, one lead to, to do some research. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely um, a completely um, new concept, not just being a large MPA, if it would be an MPA, but also international one. And there yeah. are other other large MPAs out there already. I don't know. I don't think they're as large as the Sargasso Sea, but they have the problem of potentially being a paper park, which means that it is an exactly. MPA, but it's not enforced. I know Palau is um, using. I think the U.S. is helping them with people looking at satellite data to see um, or radar to see when boats are in their um, MPA or economic zone. And then they only have, I think, two boats to, to um, react to them. Oh, and yeah. Instead yeah. of patrolling, they just do reaction. Like when they know somebody's in there, like the patrolling, patrolling is done via satellite, but then the boats go out and I think they're pretty, pretty like stringent in what they do to these other boats. Mm. I've heard something about like getting the crew off and then actually like sinking the boats or something. If um, I don't want to, if this is not right, I'm not a hundred percent sure if this is right, but the sanctions are pretty high. So if that happens to a few illegal fishing boats from other places, then the word goes around, right? That mm. this is not a good place to go. Yes. 
yeah, that, that's uh, that's another way of um, keeping people away <laughs> from you know the resources. Uh, is, uh, well, well, we it, don't it, it that way. <laughs> yeah, it, it sounds like we need to have an interview with someone on MPAs mm-hmm. sometime in the near future, and all. Uh, and uh, that that might be a useful thing. That's uh, certainly fascinating. One one of the problems I think with MPAs is uh, the uses for them aren't communicated clearly to the stake other stakeholders that might, that have been exploiting these things. And I think that's one of the the shortcomings of that. So yeah, we need to we need to get somebody to interview about MPAs, and I'll mm-hmm. follow up on that. And uh, <clears throat> well, everybody, it's been a wonderful day. We've had a really great interview, and oh, and this one was very exciting. And I'll talk about the ecosystem itself instead of some of the other things we've been talking about. And I also uh, just want to thank all of you for being here and uh, want to see you again real soon. Uh, look for you next week. And I'll and y'all, uh, have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. And thanks for getting me into it. And Brian, thank you very much. Hey, thanks for tuning in today and learning with us from our guest. If you want more information about what our guests talked about today, then, then check with our uh, show notes and links and information in our archives below. And don't forget to like and share our podcast with your friends. If you enjoyed our podcast, then please consider supporting us financially by becoming a Patreon. For as little as a dollar per month, you can support us and take part in an exclusive monthly Zoom meet and greet for Patreons where you can network with our podcast guests and other sargassum enthusiasts. The Sargassum Podcast is produced by Marine Conservation Without Borders and is made possible with financial support from the Kimberly Green Latin American and Caribbean Centers, U.S. Department of Education, Title VI grant. It is produced by Marcel van de Kamp and Francisca Elmer, and your hosts today were Robbie Tickpen, Francisca Elmer, and Mark Fernandez. We will be back next week with another exciting guest. The music of this podcast is from the song Dem A Pray by Drizzle Road Rana, an artist from Ruatan. Follow him on Spotify or YouTube for more music. But for now, here's the full song Dem A Pray. Hey, brother, hear me now. Brother, dog. Know me. Understand. Now for them no one fish see we get nothing. That's why they must be free and always front and star. Now for them no one fish see we get nothing. That's why they must be free. Now for them a free. Free they must free. They must free me no gain progress. Now for them a free. They must free me no reap success. Now for them a free. Free they must free. They must free me no gain progress. Now for them a free. They my free me to reap success So me tell them yeah What it is for man me no take that Only if it come from Ja I'll accept that Not for them I put the trust in And give me set back Yo select that Me lamp pull up that Tell some we get that But mind me no fear them Anytime them cheat and chat Me no hear them Me dash a few hearts So go the queer them Me dash a few hearts So tell them wear them Not for them I'm free They my free me in progress, not for them a free Them a free, me to reap success So me tell them yeah Yes, me know me have a lot of fake friends But me never would have taught me would have have fake family So me tell them straight, me no trust them Me no trust you and me no trust him Fake friend lost, lost bad mind in a real life Star, me no rate that Star, me no rate that yeah. Me real for me would have bust a million shot in a real life real, real, real Not for them a free they my free, me no gain progress, not for them a free They my free, me no reap success, not for them a free They my free, me no gain progress, not for them a free They my free, me no reap success, so me tell you yeah. Like, but they my hate and grudge and creep on mine. They my move like Judas. Yeah, they my move like Judas. Plus, every 
everybody have a life to live So when I give one rash clock to a try judge me Like them chit chat to what them want to say Cause none of them out there not nah, feed None yeah. of them are free yeah. 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 Them are free me no in progress None of them are free Them are free me no rape success None of them are free them a free me no gain progress Now for them a free Them a free me no rip success I'm so